In the beginning, there was no fire, and the world was cold. Then the thunders, who lived in the upper world, sent their lightning and put fire into the bottom of a hollow sycamore tree. And so, with the help of the thunder, the people were given something that would warm. That is the Cherokee Indian tale of the beginning of fire. There was fire in America, from lightning, from volcanoes. Fires were started, and the people learned to use the fire. A month after landing at Plymouth, the pilgrims had built one small common house. Several of the pilgrims slept in the house, while the others slept aboard the Mayflower, anchored a mile offshore. Sparks ignited the thatched roof. God save us, that we took it for! Fire! 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 Fire out of control was a danger to everyone, so the job of fire protection became the responsibility of the whole community. Benjamin Franklin formed Philadelphia's first volunteer fire brigade in 1736. Fire may fall into chinks and make no appearance till midnight. When your stairs are aflame, you may be forced, as I once was, to leap from your window and to hazard your necks to avoid being over-roasted. I wrote a paper on the different accidents and carelessness by which houses are set on fire and means proposed of avoiding them. This gave rise to forming a company for the ready extinguishing of fires. Our articles obliged every member to keep a number of leather buckets on hand to be brought to every fire. Since these institutions, our city has not lost to fire more than one or two houses at a time. One fire in little way! Fire wardens were appointed to prevent fire and sound the alarm in case of fire. Straighten it out. Informal clubs and societies were formed around some firefighting equipment, mostly hand-drawn, hand-operated pumps. During those early years of America, the fires of war were frequent. There were wars between the settlers and the Indians, as well as wars among the British, Dutch, Spanish, and French settlers. In the Revolution, towns were burned, as were individual houses and barns. During the War of 1812, fires deliberately started by invading British troops burned the Capitol building, President Madison's house, the War Department, and the Treasury building in Washington, D.C. The last major war to touch the United States at home was the Civil War. To cut the Confederacy in two, General Sherman marched across Georgia to the sea. Sherman captured Atlanta, a city of 10,000, and the South's major rail center. The city was evacuated and put to the torch. The fires destroyed the rail yards, the factories, and more than 4,000 homes. After the Civil War, as industry grew, people flocked to live and work in cities. Hand-pumped fire engines were gradually replaced by more efficient steam engines, fired by coal and pulled by horses. Professional fire companies were organized first in Cincinnati, then other cities. Still, there were more damaging fires. In 1871, Chicago caught fire. The fastest growing city in the United States was built almost entirely of wood. There had been three months without rain. Fires were frequent, and the fire companies exhausted. On October 9, a fire started near the O'Leary's barn on DeCoven Street. Legend has it because Mrs. O'Leary's cow kicked over a kerosene lantern. Block after block took fire. Fire companies from as far away as Milwaukee and Cincinnati came to the aid of Chicago. Before it was extinguished, the fire burned one-third of the city's buildings more than 250 died. 
National Fire Prevention Week marks the anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire. While Chicago's fire is remembered, all but forgotten is a fire which took place the same day a few hundred miles away. In the great north woods, the rainless summer dried the rivers and the smell of burning wood was always in the air. 1,800 people lived in Peshtigo, Wisconsin, a lumber town with buildings and sidewalks of wood with streets covered by sawdust to keep down the dust. That day, gale force winds drove a hurricane of fire into the town. An inferno destroyed Peshtigo and 23 other towns, leaving 800 dead, many of whom drowned in lakes trying to escape the fire. Others kill themselves rather than face a horrible death by burning. It was America's worst conflagration. A year later, a fire started in downtown Boston. Distemper had disabled the fire department's horses, and heavy equipment had to be towed by hand. Hose streams would not reach higher than three stories. The fire spread rapidly through the six and seven story buildings and over the heads of the firefighters to the wharf area where ships were set afire. 1,600 firefighters from 30 cities responded, but their hose couplings did not fit Boston's hydrants. 60 acres of buildings were destroyed before the fire was controlled. Two firefighters were among the 13 fatalities. Because of this fire, Boston improved its fire prevention and building regulations and created a number of new firefighting companies. But 30 years later, there were still no standards for fire department hose couplings. When a fire broke out in Baltimore in 1904, an automatic alarm brought a quick response from firefighters. But the fire spread to nearby buildings. Help was sent from Washington, Philadelphia, New York, and other cities, but mismatched couplings were a great handicap. It took 30 hours to control the fire. 2,500 buildings and 80 city blocks were destroyed. This conflagration did lead to the development of a national standard thread for hose couplings. Two years after the Baltimore fire, a severe earthquake started fires all over San Francisco. Strong winds spread the fires rapidly. The quake ruptured water mains and firefighters had to use water out of the sewers. Buildings were dynamited to make fire breaks, but sparks, brands, and radiated heat jumped the gaps. The fire burned for two days, leaving 450 dead and 300,000 homeless. Fires at sea have long terrified people. When ships were built of wood, fire hazards were many and often mortal to the ship, its passengers, and crew. New York City, June 1904. 1,400 parishioners of St. Mark's Church board the sidewheel steamer General Slocum for the annual church picnic. As the Slocum steams up the East River, a boy discovers fire in a forward hold. The Slocum's headway and a strong breeze sweep the flames aft. Passengers grab life preservers but find them rotten. So are the fire hoses which rupture when water is turned on. The untrained crew lowers lifeboats improperly and the boats capsize. Near Hellgate, the Slocum sinks. The death toll, 1,030. The loss of almost an entire neighborhood. The disaster brings about inspection of 300 ships in New York Harbor. Defective life preservers, hose, and inadequate firefighting equipment are found on many vessels. At 3 a.m. on September 8, 1934, fire is discovered aboard the cruise ship Morrow Castle. The passengers are asleep as she steams home to New York through a rainstorm. Within 30 minutes, the Morrow Castle is a sheet of flames. Passengers panic and leap into the water. Many suffer fatal injuries, others drown. In the confusion and excitement, my wife must have went over the rail. I haven't seen her since. I don't know whether she's alive or not. By morning, when the ship runs aground off Asbury Park, New Jersey, 86 passengers and 49 crew members are dead. 1960. The aircraft carrier Constellation is under construction at the Brooklyn Navy Yard when fire breaks out. 
the lights fail, and workers are trapped in the smoky darkness below decks. When the fire is out, 50 workers lie dead, and the carrier suffers $48 million in damage. The Iroquois Theater burned in 1903. Ruth McGibney survived the fire. It was the Christmas week, the Wednesday matinee between Christmas and New Year's, and a brand new theater, and a brand new play, and every, all the young people in Chicago were there, I think, just standing room. A piece of burning paper about the size of a plate was drifted down onto the stage, looking very yellow in the blue light. And the singers saw it and moved away, but went on with their song. And pretty soon, some more burning paper dropped down, and they walked off the stage. And uh, the lights came on, and somebody jumped up and said, is this a fire? And Eddie Foy came out and said, was there a little bit of wastebasket fire? But it's uh, under control. We're going to lower the asbestos curtain. You can all walk out quietly and get your money back. And while he was standing there, um, asbestos curtain started down, rolling down the great big bar across. But it stuck halfway and sort of skewed G. And pretty soon the flames started to come, little tongues of flame come up underneath it. And then, just all of a sudden, everybody panicked and jumped up, made for the aisles to walk out, run out, rather. Most of the exits opened inward. And so there were bodies piled up against the exits. The, the um, orchestra played very loudly for a long time until they had to leave. But it wouldn't have mattered because nobody, no sound could be heard above the people and the sound of the flames. 602 died in that fire. I went over to the Coconut Grove after the Boston College Holy Cross football game. Uh, suddenly, I was uh, heard someone shout fire. And between the time that we, that shout was raised and the, uh, I uh, was overcome with the fumes, I don't believe that more than 30 seconds elapsed. Boston, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, 1942. The Coconut Grove nightclub has a seating capacity of 600, but 1,000 are in the club that night. There are paper palm trees and ceilings covered with cloth, and the main exit is a revolving door. A fire breaks out and flashes across the ceiling. We then made our way to the back of the uh, dressing rooms and burst through a window with a chair. We found a small piece of ladder there that Mr. Dave Pullman, one of the boys in the show, and myself held while the girls and boys went down the ladder and dropped into the human net that the sailors formed down below. I put all the cushions from the cars on the ground, and between 20 and 30 people jumped to safety. But in the panic, 492 are dead of flames and toxic smoke. 200 are piled up at the main door, 180 more behind a door that opens inward. As a result of the Coconut Grove, Fire laws all over America are changed and more stringently enforced to require unobstructed exits, doors that swing outward in buildings used for public assembly, and fire retardant decorations. It is hot in Hartford two days after Independence Day 1944. 7,000 people are at the circus. The big top is waterproofed with paraffin. Some of the exits are blocked. Perhaps it is a discarded cigarette that ignites the outside canvas. A gust of wind blows the fire into the tent. Supporting ropes burn at once, dropping poles and flaming canvas onto the panic-stricken crowd. In a few minutes, the fire is over. 163 are burned or trampled to death. The disaster leads to the development of fire codes for places of outdoor assembly. Having been inside, when the uh announcement was made, uh, there was really no idea how serious the fire was, and consequently most people were filing out slowly, which was good because probably more people would have died had they known that uh, the fire was uh, as severe as it is. Memorial Day weekend, 1977. 2,400 are at the Beverly Hills Supper Club in Southgate, Kentucky, 1,300 of them in the huge cabaret room. The club sprawls over an acre. And though there have been several new additions, there are insufficient exits. 
Fire breaks out in an unoccupied room. The club's staff delays calling the fire department or warning the patrons while they try to fight the fire. By the time the people in the cabaret room learn of the fire, there are neither enough exits nor enough time to escape. The death toll is 165. In 1911, New York's Triangle Shirtwaist Company was located on the top three floors of a Washington Square building. In those days, there were no requirements for fire drills, fire escapes, or sprinklers in factories. A few minutes before closing, the fire started in a rag bin on the eighth floor. A newspaper man, William Shepard, reported the fire. I saw every feature of the tragedy. I learned a new sound, a more horrible sound than description can picture. It was the thud of a speeding living body on a stone sidewalk. Thud, dead, thud, dead, thud, dead, 62 thud, deads. The height was 80 feet. One girl climbed onto the window sash, then she dropped into space. I didn't notice whether those above her watched her drop because I had turned away. I looked up. Another girl was climbing onto the windowsill. She dropped. I watched her fall, and again, the dreadful sound. Firemen raised the longest ladder. It reached only to the sixth floor. I saw the last girl jump at it and miss. 146 died in that fire. The disaster led to 40 new fire ordinances in New York City and to the development of standards for fire drills and fire escapes. In Columbus, Ohio, the overcrowded state penitentiary was undergoing expansion when fire broke out on wooden scaffolding near the prison roof. Within moments, the prison was transformed into a blazing oven. The building was believed by many to be fireproof, and the warden refused to release the trapped prisoners until the National Guard arrived. Firefighters responded immediately, but the warden did not allow them into the prison. How many men did you bring out? About 18. About 18. What range was you on when you took them out? I was on the fourth range. Fourth range. How'd you get them down? A uh, lot of them down, one by one. Pass it to the other man, from range to range. In the aftermath, 300 prisoners were found dead. Shortly before America entered World War II, a large part of the country's strategic rubber supply was located in old cotton mills at Fall River, Massachusetts. Fire broke out in a rubber dryer. Sprinklers were controlling the fire when a watchman inexplicably shut the system down. The fire burned for eight days, giving off plumes of thick, black, acrid smoke. 650 firefighters came to the aid of Fall River. 13,000 tons of rubber were destroyed. The fire broke out in Atlanta's Weinkauf Hotel celebrated and widely advertised as a fireproof hotel. Perhaps because of that, there were no fire escapes, no sprinklers, no fire doors. A mattress caught fire, probably the result of a carelessly discarded cigarette. A bellboy discovered the fire, but the alarm was delayed. When firefighters were summoned, their efforts were hampered by bodies plummeting from the upper stories. It was America's worst hotel fire. 119 were dead, 200 injured. The word fireproof was seldom to be used again. There were 128 people in St. Anthony's Hospital on the night of April 4, 1949. The Effingham, Illinois Hospital had combustible soundproofing, a combustible laundry chute, open stairwells, and oilcloth covered walls. Most of the patients were asleep when the fire was discovered. Firefighters were on the scene in 10 minutes, but the building was fully involved. In the aftermath, 74 were found dead, including 11 babies in the nursery. The result of this disaster led to nationwide concern for hospital fire safety. The new General Motors transmission plant in Livonia, just outside Detroit, was an enormous building which included one undivided area of over 34 acres. 4,000 were at work on a summer day in 1953 when sparks from a welder's torch ignited flammable liquids in a conveyor drip pan. Melting asphalt and tar from the roof intensified the fire. Whole streams of firefighters reached 
to 75 feet inside the building, but it was over 800 feet wide, and the collapsed roof ruled out interior attack. When the fire was out, six lay dead, and more than $50 million in damage made it the worst industrial fire loss in United States history. 1,200 students and teachers were in Our Lady of the Angels School in Chicago on a December afternoon in 1958. Fire broke out in rubbish in the basement and burned 20 minutes before it was reported. A thousand evacuated the building before firefighters arrived, but despite rescue efforts, 95 perished. Thousands of schools were soon inspected, and in many, automatic sprinklers and alarm systems were installed as a result of this fire. In a highly technological world, there are always new things that burn, hazards that we have created and from which we must protect ourselves. 1945, it is a Saturday, so only a few are at work in the Empire State Building. In the upper stories of the world's tallest building, a heavy fog obscures the morning sun. An Army Air Corps B-25 bomber, traveling at 200 miles per hour, suddenly crashes into the building between the 75th and 79th floors. Flames shoot up seven stories. The wreckage plummets to the roof of a nearby building, pouring burning fuel down its stairwells. 23 fire companies respond. Firefighters find a hole 20 feet wide and 18 feet high, torn in the north side of the building. Miraculously, only 14 are dead. Internal fire protection features in the building assist in quick extinguishment of the fire. Air disasters are only one way modern technology produces fires. Chemicals, gases, improperly used or protected can result in dangerous fires. On April 16, 1947, in the harbor of Texas City, ammonium nitrate fertilizer was being loaded into the ship Grand Camp when a stevedore cigarette started a fire in the hold. Shortly after the city's volunteer firefighters responded to fight the fire, a tremendous explosion blasted the Grand Camp into missiles weighing up to a ton, flying thousands of yards, killing the firefighters and 400 others, severing pipelines, piercing oil tanks, and igniting the contents. A chemical plant burst into flames. Fire ignited another ship, also containing ammonium nitrate. The blast created a tidal wave and blew two airplanes out of the sky. Fire departments from throughout Texas mounted a massive rescue effort, unable for more than a day to fight the fires. The ammonium nitrate in the second ship exploded. More fires were started. The worst explosions in United States history set fires that raged for three days, left 468 known dead, 100 more missing and presumed dead, 3,000 injured, and property loss of more than $400 million. Shipment of liquefied gases can be extremely hazardous in the event of an accident or fire. A blevy is a boiling liquid expanding vapor explosion. They think it's here for chloride on fire, and we're going to have to let it burn down. There's nothing we've got here to put that out. In October 1971, the Houston Fire Department was fighting a fire in a train wreck, trying to cool a railroad tank car of vinyl chloride, the tank Blevy. One firefighter was killed. The gas created a fireball more than 1,000 feet in diameter. A brush fire starts on Canyon Road in Bel Air, California in 1961. The humidity is low, and the Santa Ana's 35 mile an hour winds off the desert blow up the canyon. The fire spreads from tinder dry chaparral to houses with wood shingles. Jumps Mulholland Drive as sparks and burning brands are lifted by thermal columns and carried miles by the wind. 24 fire departments. 2,100 firefighters, 240 vehicles, 12 planes, and five helicopters fight the fire. 450 homes and 5,000 acres are destroyed. Two-thirds of the houses destroyed had roofs of wood shakes or shingles. The Apollo series of missions is destined to put the first men on the moon. 
Oxygen is used in the command module of the Apollo 1 rocket and in the spacesuits of astronauts Virgil Grissom, Edward Waite, and Roger Chaffee. At 6.30 p.m. January 27, 1967, on the launching pad at Cape Kennedy, an electrical spark touches off urethane inside the module. The oxygen-rich environment causes the fire to burn with fierce intensity. Emergency crews try to fight the fires, but are blocked by dense smoke. The fire flashes quickly and is over. But the three astronauts die, and there is $75 million in damage. Though the fire is a severe jolt to the space program, engineers redesign the modules with fire safe features, which leads ultimately to improved fire safety in commercial airliners. In the 100 years after the British burned our nation's capital during the War of 1812, many of America's great cities burned in fires not the result of war. By the 1970s, many assumed that the age of conflagrations was over. But the same conditions that led to fire that burned 3,500 Chelsea buildings in 1908 were still existent in 1973. Rags and other combustible waste materials were closely stored in wood frame buildings. On a windy fall Sunday, the fire started. Fire departments from all over eastern Massachusetts responded. But the fire burned from building to building, block to block, uncontrolled. By many nations, Americans are considered wasteful, profligate. Certainly, Americans are careless about fire and tend to consider fires unpreventable acts of fate. Arson, the deliberate starting of fire for profit or revenge or vandalism, is not an accident. It has been a problem since colonial times, but today the problem has reached epidemic proportions. We have not been able to stop arson. In some communities, like the South Bronx, people live in constant fear of arson and the consequent tragedy. I couldn't sleep. When night come, I've been sleeping and been listening. It's a miserable, terrible condition to live like that. Vacant buildings, often the target of arson, pose great dangers to firefighters. There's no roof on this particular building. The stairwells are out, and uh, it's very uh, hazardous. Uh, a guy could get hurt very easily in there. The causes of arson are connected to some of the major problems facing our society. The record of fire tragedy grows longer day after day, year after year. As 1980 drew to a close, America was shocked by a fire which killed 84 in a magnificent modern Las Vegas hotel. How could such a disaster be possible today? What is wrong? The weakness lies not in our fire safety technology, but in our will to use it. The means for preventing such tragedies are well known and readily available. Fire protection is always an expense and unless the law demands these features, they are likely to appear quite unnecessary to the building owner. Gamblers with fire are found everywhere, not just in Las Vegas. The laws and regulations, which most people imagine assure fire safety in buildings, are only as strong as the local government can make them in the face of great pressure to keep them as weak and as flexible as possible. That is the real lesson of fire in America.